So I've got to open with an apology, I'm afraid. So I proposed this talk uh, three months ago, and we've had some small schedule slippage. So the software I'm describing is not quite as finished as I planned it to be. But it is, as of yesterday, published online, open source, so you can get access to it, and you can contribute to it. And I'll come back to that later. Um, right, so my name is Ross Duncan, and I'm the head of quantum software at Continuum. So Continuum is, I believe, the largest uh, quantum computing company. There's about 500 people in the company. Uh, we're split between US, mostly in Colorado, three sites in the UK, an office here in Munich, though unfortunately our local representative is ill this week, so he's not here today, and an office in, in Tokyo. So the company is actually formed as a merger between Cambridge Quantum, where I used to work, and a unit of Honeywell, which is spun off the merger and formed this company. So Cambridge Quantum uh, made quantum software, mostly applications and developer tools. Honeywell Quantum Solutions make trapped ion quantum computers. So between the two halves, we've got kind of the whole stack, and this nice uh, division of responsibilities. Although the boundary is actually a bit more fractal than that diagram might suggest. Um, we are quite a research-heavy company, as most quantum startups are, and we do a lot of research in applications of quantum computers. So in my office in Cambridge, we have a team which works on quantum algorithms for Monte Carlo integration and topological data analysis. We have some other people who work on machine learning and optimization. We have a bunch of other people who work on quantum simulations. And I just want to pull out a couple of highlights from our recent papers to mention before I get to the meat of my talk. So here is one from earlier this year. Um, the new H2 machine, the Munich team, was able to demonstrate the first uh, non-abelian topological order in a quantum system. So it's uh, using a D4 anions, and they did actually manage to braid the anions in the system. More recently, uh, some of the Cambridge team and the team in Japan have been doing um, chemistry simulations, which you might think this is a very old topic because people have been calculating the ground state of hydrogen for five years already. But this time they did it with quantum phase estimation, which is an algorithm that most people believe can't be done on NISC machines. Uh, they've used a quantum error detection code to do this. So it's still a small calculation, but it's something that we probably couldn't have done in the recent past. And on the subject of firsts, another recent paper, the team based mostly in Cambridge, has recently shown the first demonstration of fault tolerant arithmetic in a quantum computer. Now it's only one plus one equals two, let's not get carried away here. But it is the first time, as far as I know, where we have the physical qubits getting outperformed by the logical qubits for a real, cal for a real calculation. Um, so that was done using the H1 computer. So again, that's a, an error detection code rather than an error correction code, but still. Okay. So. Before I get into the, the subject of ticket two, I should probably put it in some context. So I'll give a kind of a rundown of the stack. So we've seen earlier, you know, yesterday, some pretty complicated diagrams. I could walk through all of, all of this stuff, which is already quite a simple one, but I thought in the interest of simplicity, I would just simplify it back to this picture I showed you earlier. And when I say quantum software, the top layer, I mean specifically applications. So piece of software that does something useful to a non-quantum information researcher, or a library, a piece of supporting code for that software. And at the bottom, the hardware we'll be talking about, my main interest is in our own hardware, the H-series ion traps. But we also support all the other quantum computers that we know about, 
And any realistic software will actually also have a non-trivial bit of classical runtime as well, whether that's your laptop or a GPU or some HPC facility. And then the glue between these things is, of course, the compiler, which is called Ticket. In case I was wondering. So I'll do a quick run through of what this looks like. So the main application software we make in Continuum is this package in Quanto, which does computational chemistry. And the reason why we're doing computational chemistry is we believe that this is uh, an area where quantum advantage is likely to come reasonably early in history. So the nice thing about quantum chemistry is the theory is completely understood. But the bad thing is that to actually compute anything, you're in this n factorial regime for the accurate version of the theory. So you basically can't afford to do any computation, apart from the absolute smallest molecules of hydrogen. And as you go to simpler theories, you can work with bigger systems, but your accuracy goes down. And the belief is that this red target is the area where near-term quantum computers will be able to reach. So much higher accuracy uh, in a reasonable amount of time. I won't go through all the steps of this because it's not that interesting unless you want to do some chemistry calculations. But I just want to point out the number of layers here. And, and as we go down the levels, we're kind of switching from an application-oriented view, which is say something which is about molecules or materials, into something which is becoming more um, mathematical, and then into a level of quantum algorithms, and then into actually running things in the quantum device. And so each time you take a step, you're getting a bit further away from the problem and a bit closer to the hardware. And so you've got to come down to the hardware, run something, then come all the way back up again. Okay, so that is the, um, the archetypal application for us. I'll speak briefly about Ticket. So this is the compiler that we've made in Cambridge Quantum for the last six years. And it has historically supported a wide range of platforms. So I'll just start on. It is open source and you can get it from PIP. So I encourage everyone to try it out. Um, I also encourage you, if you're going to try it out and use it as a benchmark against your own work, please talk to us, because the, uh, it's not always obvious how to use it, and we've seen a lot of unreproducible papers coming out this way. So, at its core, there's a C++ library, which is very fast, uh, and that's wrapped up in Python to make it easy to use. There are a variety of extension modules, uh, but also written in Python, and these provide compatibility between Ticket and other systems. So, for example, if you want to use our hardware, you would download the additional PyTicket Continuum module, and that will give support for the H-series computers. And when I say support, I mean uh, custom compilation passes to generate circuits that are compatible with that hardware. If you want to use Qiskit, either as a front end to program in, or to target the IBM Q back ends, you can use the PyTicket Qiskit um, extension. And so this actually functions as a, as a cross compiler. So you can write your program in circ if you wanted to, and then have it run on each series, or any other combination like that. Um, what else? Yeah, so our intention with Ticket was to make it very good at optimizing circuits and very good at uh, layout of circuits on fixed hardware. There's a lot of different compiler passes in here. So if you are using the <coughs> system and you just do O1, you're probably not going to get the best results. So do experiment with the different options. There's lots of them and they can be combined in any way. All right, I'm going to talk more about Ticket later, so I won't say anything else just now. Okay, the hardware. This is quite interesting. So, as I said, we make uh, iron traps. 
the, there is a road map from H1 up to H5. I don't know what happens at H5. Maybe we move on to the next letter of the alphabet. Maybe we just go to 6. So this is where we are now. This is the newest hardware. This one also is uh, live as well. And this one is foreseen sometime in about two years' time. So H2, it's uh, in this racetrack configuration, currently with 32 qubits loaded. I believe this is the highest uh, fidelity 2 qubit gates on any commercially available system. The ions are actually mobile in the trap, so you've effectively got all-to-all -all connectivity, so any ion can interact with any other ions just by moving them together. And it has a very useful feature of being able to measure qubits, reset them, and use the outcomes of that measurement later in the computation. The H1, which is the slightly older computer, 20 qubits, has currently the record for quantum volume, uh, 2 to the 19. It was briefly the H2, but the, uh, the H1 team went and did a lot more quantum volume experiments, so now they're the winners. But here's a, a better picture of the trap. So you can see it's this kind of racetrack shape. The ions can rotate round, they can exchange positions, and in each of these places in the blue here, what we call a gate zone where a laser can be brought to bear on the ions to activate the, the gates. So in fact, the ions are suspended beneath the trap in a magnetic field and held in place by these radio frequency electrodes. In fact, each qubit consists of a pair of ions, an ytterbium ion, which is the actual qubit, and a barium ion, which is used for sympathetic cooling. Because when the ions move around the trap, they get warmed up. And that's not very good because the emotional mode stores the data. So the barium ions are laser cooled, which sympathetically cools the qubits. And in the gate zones, you see if you want to do a two qubit gate, then we actually fire four lasers in this kind of crossing pattern into it for single qubit gates. Just the one, sorry, just a pair of lasers, cool in here. And for measurement, we actually have the ability to move the non-observed qubit out of the way to reduce crosstalk. So this is very, very clean. Um, okay. So the gates that are supported hardware, single qubit gates, um, Z rotation is just done by phase tracking, so that's error free. And the Rx has an error region of 2.5, that's 10 to the minus 3. So that's pretty clean. Two qubit gates is a molmer sorensen interaction, um, and the error is just about 2, that's 10 to the minus 3. Um, what's interesting is this number here is the average over all the angles. So the error depends linearly on the angle. The less time the laser is turned on, less error. Okay, so if you want to know more, all of the specifications of the machine are posted on GitHub. It's not, uh, the parameters don't drift in the way that superconducting devices do, so they're only updated every couple of months rather than every twice a day. Um, but you want to get the details up there. And the one last thing I want to say about the hardware is this thing I mentioned about measure and reuse. So, because the qubits can be reset after they've been measured, you can use them again in the same program. Now, if you do a bit of analysis of the lifetime of your qubit in the program, you can achieve some really remarkable savings in qubits. So here, using this um, qubit reuse algorithm, depending on, the different, on what you're actually doing here, you can achieve exponential reductions in the number of qubits you need because you don't necessarily need them all at the same time. So, for example, depth d humera, normally you would need two to d qubits, but by being a bit clever, you can get away with just d, or 2d minus 1.
the book here. Right, so I said I was going to talk about post NISC compilers, so I thought I'd better say a few words about what NISC is before we get into it. So, as everyone here knows, the point of NISC is intermediate scale, which is the definition introduced by Preskill. Um, Preskill says it's about 50 to 100 qubits, um, which is enough that it's difficult to simulate this, but it's not enough we can actually do error correction, so we're going to have to live with the noise. Now, what's less obvious is that if you have noise, you've already got a scale limitation. You can't have, you can't effectively use an unbounded number of qubits, even if you had them, because the noise will wash, wash out the data. But the other thing, which is not obvious at first, is that if your system is noisy, it's actually easier to simulate than if it was um, noise-free. And these two properties combine to mean that when we're thinking about NIST machines, we're not thinking about every possible quantum algorithm, we're thinking about a relatively restricted couple of families. So people always talk about QAOA and VQE because the circuits are shallow. So basically you're trading depth for the number of shots. However, something like phase estimation, we typically don't associate with NISC machines because the depth of the circuit is such that it will be just noise by the end. Okay, so that's the kind of caricature of what NISC is. This microphone is really annoying me. Um, okay, I'm going to... If I take it off, can you hear me okay? Oh, all right? All right. <coughs> Sorry. Right. Okay. That's better. Right. So, um, a few years ago we put a paper describing Ticket. Uh, here's my top advice for anyone who's in the business of naming things. Don't put any mathematical symbols in your names. It's a, it's a nightmare. It never goes away. Anyway, we put in the paper and we called it Planet for NISC Devices. So what was the actual implication of that? So there's a few things which matter in that context. The first thing is that in every, in every quantum device that I know about anyway, the two qubit gates are noisier than everything else, or noisier than the one qubit gate anyway. So the thing that we aim to optimize over is the number of two qubit gates, and in particular the depth of the circuit, because depth loosely correlates to time, which correlates to decoherence. So you want to minimize the amount of decoherence, you want to minimize the amount of noise. Um, if we're thinking about superconducting architectures, where we've got a variance in the performance of the different components, then we also want to pick which ones we're using carefully to avoid any unnecessary noise. Uh, so Ticket had fairly early on a good method for avoiding the least performing elements and the sort of conducting architectures. Something else you can do in the noisy regime is you can approximate your gates, which if you know if your circuit's going to be deep, you can pick up X amount of noise, so you might actually do better by doing a shallower circuit, which isn't exactly what your programmer asked for, but it'll be closer to it than doing what you asked for. Um, because we're always thinking about variational algorithms, we have to deal with um, symbolic circuits, by which I mean circuits with parameters. So we do optimization across the parameters as well. And because these kind of algorithms usually are very heavy on the number of shots, whenever possible, we try and combine measurements. So we do fewer measurements, <coughs> so we extract the same observables. Yep. So these are the kind of things that you would care about in a NISC device. And the other thing that you would do um, is error mitigation. So we also have a library for error mitigation. It's called Kermit. I'm not really going to talk about it today. It's also open source. Go check it out. Um, the main concept here is that there's two kinds of mitigation. One where you modify the distribution of your results to achieve something which is closer to the ideal. And one where you modify the expectation of some observable. Um, so this is basically types, if you think about it in computer science terms. There's a whole bunch of different methods implemented there. 
a thing which is quite nice is that it has this compositional structure, so you can easily combine different things together. And so my labels have gone missing, but this red part is uh, this is a spam correction routine, which has nested inside it a frame randomization, which can be combined in the other order if you want to. Okay, so the point of uh, error mitigation is to make your statistics more like statistics, statistics you would have got had you not had errors. Okay, so that was NISC. So, what do I mean by I say post NISC? So, um, if you remember Matthias's talk yesterday, you'll remember that fault tolerant computation resource estimates are exceptionally demanding, millions of qubits. Whereas in the NISC regime, we're in tens or maybe low hundreds of qubits. So when I'm talking about post-NISC, I basically mean somewhere in between. So a few thousands of qubits. I put 5,000, could be more, could be less. But in this regime, there are a few things which are different to both of the other ones. The first thing is, we're probably working with logical qubits, which is to say, encoded in some error protection scheme. Uh, which means we'll also need to have some kind of magic states to achieve universality. However, because we still have this resource limit, we're not going to be able to exploit the threshold theorem so we're going to run out of resources before we can get down to arbitrarily low error rates. And so we're still going to be noisy. And so we're going to be combining so error correction methods with mitigation methods. So that's the kind of of regime we're in here. There's a few other kind of obvious and less obvious things that come with the hardware. So bigger devices, bigger circuits, so your compiler needs to be more efficient. And you have to have better algorithms for uh, optimizing the circuits. Um, the need to avoid noise is still there, just as much as it was in the NISC regime. Um, the algorithms we want to run on these devices will be different. We're probably not going to be doing VQE. Um, and a side effect of this is because we're on the track towards doing fault tolerant computing, we expect to have a non trivial amount of classical compute in the real time environment, which is to say within the coherence time of the qubit. If you don't have this, then you're probably not going to do error correction. Um, and the last point, which I think Laura really nailed yesterday morning was the fact that we're probably going to be moving from this kind of laptop fridge relationship into a much bigger heterogeneous compute environment possibly involving HPC resources or GPUs or other more exotic things. Okay, so these are all factors that have to come into the design of a thing like Ticket 2. So um, this is the URL. Please check it out. It's not published on PyPy yet. But yeah. So you just have to download the source and compile it. It's written in Rust mostly. Uh, so please dig it. <coughs> and so this is my, my disclaimer that this is a very much work in progress, so everything may change. Okay, so something that's been part of the philosophy of Ticket from the beginning is to try and give programmers the highest level objects we can offer by which I mean at the highest level of abstraction. So you didn't, if you want to think about your algorithm in terms of exponentiated Pauli's, the compiler allows you to say that. It doesn't make you translate it into C naughts. Because every time a programmer has to think at a lower level of abstraction, the compiler has to reverse that in order to do its optimization. OK, so some things that we have um, in ticket already. I think all of these things are in already. Um, SU4 gate, arbitrary SU4 is a standard two qubit gate. And then we have the ability to rebase that to any other gate or any other common gate anyway. If you want to use something which we don't know how to rebase, you can add the conversion yourself. Um, any kind of circuit can have any kind of arbitrary control attached to it. So whether it turned on or off based on the value of some other qubits. Uh, we have uh, 
So the concept of box is like a higher level programming thing than gate, usually a subcircuit. So we have boxes which represent parallel operators, we have this compute uncompute pattern, and multiplexers as well. I'm going to talk a little bit more about multiplexers um, because they're cool. So this is what I mean by a multiplexer. What you see is I've got two registers, one of which is just holding effectively an index, and one of which is the target. So this is a kind of generalization of controlled gate. And so the idea here is that for every possible value of i in my control register, I've got a different unit tree I'm going to apply on the target. And the notation looks something like this. So these half white, half black boxes are stand in for every possible value of one and zero. And you can see that sums up to be when they're all zeros to this one, when the first one is flipped to this one, and so on. Okay. So a place where this rather maybe this seems a bit weird. A place where it comes up a lot is in linear combination of unit trees and coil signal processing, other related algorithms, which are the kind of thing we're going to want to be doing on uh, non-NISCI machines, because they're quite big circuits. So here's the, the usual pattern for linear combination of unit trees. There's some Hamiltonian, which is a sum of Pauli's, and that Hamiltonian is a parameter of this select gadget in the middle. And it's this select gadget, when we unpack it, we see that it actually is one of these multiplexers. So I'm not going to go through the details of the algorithm we implemented, because it's quite complicated. But basically, this web of controls here can also be thought of as computing permutations over the bit strings. And so if you do a bit of, uh, a bit of cunning thinking about this, as our colleagues back at Cambridge did, you can come up with a method for doing this quite efficiently. So this is a big table of a variety of simulations, which were done using the LCU algorithm. Uh, you can see, so Qlibs is an internal library, which is just like a naive implementation, nothing fancy. Uh, and multiplexer is the new feature of Ticket. And you can see that, worst case, we're getting rid of 80% of the circuit. And best case, 97% of the circuit. Um, so this is against Naive. We also compare it against Tweedledum. And we can beat Tweedledum by up to 40% as well. So, talk to you, Shelley. And our colleagues uh, in the quantum machine learning uh, algorithm actually used this to um, demonstrate QSP on the iron trap hardware. Again, something that was not believed to be doable on a NISC machine. But they did a, um, a time evolution of a, a simple icing spin model using QSP. Um, okay. The other thing which we want to do with Ticket 2, which is a little bit orthogonal to the, other, to the main topic here, is to make it easier for you to do experiments. Particularly for people who are writing error correction codes or decoders, but just general rewrites of circuits. So in the original Ticket, I have to be honest, I think we made a mistake in philosophy. And we thought, we'll write the world's best compilation passes, and the users can just choose between them. Which nobody ever did any choosing, and it was too difficult for them to do their own thing. So that wasn't great. So the decision we've made now is to expose the underlying graph structure of the circuit in a kind of user-friendly way, so that you can write your own rewrite patterns here. And the idea, or well, one of the ideas, the simplest idea, is that you just say a rewrite rule by saying, whenever I see this subgraph, replace it with this one. And then the, uh, I'll just show you the code, it's easier. So for example, here's a circuit. You can see it's got four qubits. We've got CX, CX, and another CX. Now that's the circuit I'm going to rewrite. Yes, one of the qubits is redundant, yeah. And my two rules, I have a left-hand side, L, which says if I do CX, and I do CX in the same qubits, that should be equal to the empty circuit. And then I can just create this as a rule, and then give it to this 
predefined routine called rule matcher, which takes a list of rules and returns your place in your circuit where that rule matches. And then you can apply the rewrite at that match point to disrupt the predefined <coughs> circuit. Of course, you can write your own rule matcher. Um, you can <coughs> generate rules dynamically as you go because all the low-level stuff is available to you if you want it. But if you just want to write down a rewrite theory, then you can do that. And you're not restricted to doing it one rule at a time. So here's an example where we've got two rules. Uh, so this is h led then h gets replaced with x. Very simple uh, equation. And h then h is equal to the empty circuit. And so then we do the, the find and replace in a loop. Because if I generate more than one match, then that would, if I apply it, then that invalidates all the matches that I found. And so you can do that. And so it's not quite simple. Um, so I've shown these examples in Python. Uh, but the core engine is written in Rust, so you program Rust, you can also use that. Okay, and what's really making this go underneath is our new matcher, mostly written by my colleague Luca. Um, and so this is a matcher which finds matches for sets of rules at the same time, and it doesn't really slow down, no matter how many rules you add to the set. I mean, it does slow down a little bit, but not very much. Um, so we used quartz to generate a huge database of rewrite rules, and then compared how fast it was to quartz. So fair is fair, quartz doesn't have an optimized rewrite engine, so <coughs> don't expect it to be fast. Um, but we are about two orders of magnitude faster, which means that we do in a few tens of seconds, which would take quartz like an hour. Um, and because we're so fast, it means we can do more search, which means that we can actually get better um, circuits out of the pack. So this is a few results. It's all very preliminary because we're just using the rewrite theory of quartz rather than one that we've tuned ourselves. Um, so we can see that giving the, the search engine I think 15 minutes per circuit on this one, so that's quite a lot of time. Uh, we can beat Qiskit and PyTicket on a de decent uh, fraction of this set. So there's two uh, results here on the slide. So we have a large collection of benchmark circuits we use, and we discovered that on some of them, this doesn't do anything at all. But when we exclude those ones, we're left with these three classes. Uh, deep circuits, which are like synthetic <coughs> chemistry Hamiltonian circuits, QAOA circuits, and the, the classical reversible examples from the paper of Nam et al. And you can see that in the best case for, uh, for these ones, we can get up to 50% better than KISS kit and up to 25% better than five ticket. And so it seems to be particularly good at QAOA for some reason that we don't understand. Um, right. Um, I'm not going to say very much about this because I don't have a good example to show you, but the H-series hardware supports having um, WASM calls at runtime. So you can basically add an external function call to your circuit. Um, so you can write that in Rust, compile it to or C or whatever, compile it to WASM and link it against your circuit, and that can be executed in quantum runtime. This is kind of basic at the moment, uh, but there's going to be more classical control, more added to this in the future. So if you wanted to write like a very simple lookup table based decoder, that's very easy. If you want to do something more complicated, it should be possible, uh, but we might have to wait for the next upgrade to the hardware. Okay, now, you might be starting to wonder then, if I've got 
quantum circuits and classical control and classical arithmetic, what is the actual representation of this program? So the thing which is the real um, guts of new ticket is the thing we call Hugger, which is a, a new IR, basically. Hierarchical Unified Graph Representation. So it's um, hierarchical graphs. You can represent mixed programs with quantum and classical parts. It has linearity built in and can speak to, you can accept various inputs and will generate various <coughs> outputs. So you can have um, graph representations of quantum circuits. Don't look too closely at this one, the example is wrong. Um, we can have hybrid programs. So you can see I've got a circuit which is conditioned on a classical variable at the top here, which generates this nice three-layered three case statement. And we can have programs where different parts of the program run in different environments. So here we'd have something which is the driver program, and here we have something which would be running either in hardware or simulation. Um, I'm not going to go through this, it's probably not worth it, but here's an example of C sharp program to do repeat until success, and this is the hugger that would be generated from that program. Okay, and the last thing I want to say about ticket, I think, is how are we going to connect everything else? So, QER. Cotinium has been a member of the QIR lines for quite a long time, uh, so we'll be supporting QIR as both output and input um, very soon. Um, and our intention is to wrap the, the new representation in an MLIR dialect so we can integrate other compilation tools as well. And so in these mixed programs, there will be some code which isn't running in a quantum real-time environment, that can be lowered to LLVM and developed natively. Okay. <coughs> right, I'll just say a little bit more about the topics. So, I mentioned earlier that the, the quantum computer's own runtime is not the whole story. Right? Every, every program also has a classical bit running a normal computer. And the way that we like to think about that is a system called PeerCrest. This was pre presented at supercomputing conference um, last year. And so what, what are we doing here? We're trying to bring together all the different parts. So we have compilation, we have pre-processing of data, we have post-processing of data, we might have an optimization loop where we're going to go back to the quantum computers. This whole program is quite, quite slow, especially if you've got a long queue in front of your quantum computer. So you want to have something which can, can process distributed software and asynchronous. And that's the point of, of GeoPress. So it's, uh, it's data flow language, or sorry, it's data flow representation of mixed quantum classical programs. It's designed to be evaluated asynchronously, so it's driven each node fires when its inputs are ready. And the the idea here is that each node can, in principle, live on a different host. So the nodes themselves are pure functional primitives, and the data goes along the edges. Okay, so that gives a partial order structure to the graph, which is the only constraint on the execution order, otherwise things would happen in, in any order. <coughs> So this is a higher order system, so graphs themselves are values, so you can pass graphs as data. Um, there's built-in constructs for looping, uh, which are implemented in higher order functions. And everything is statically typed. The basic split in Geocrisis is between what we call a runtime, which basically manages that graph, and a worker, which does the evaluation of the nodes. So which means that you could have specialized implementations for all your functions. In particular, if you don't trust me, you don't want to run your program on my computer, you can run the untrustable bit on your computer and everything else can live somewhere else. And it also means that 
workers are basically an interface, so you can just wrap any existing code you have and deploy it relatively easily. Um, okay. So here is an example of how this might go. I've got my, my client sitting with a, a laptop computer which can transmit to this runtime the program that they want to run. So there'll be a built-in worker to do all the basic system functions, but there might be a remote worker providing something else. And I would expect there's a, at least one remote worker, which is a quantum computer, to the quantum part of it. But this could be wrapped up to something more complicated. So we could have uh, some runtime living in the HPC, which has access to various quantum computers, possibly mediated by some other runtimes. So it's quite flexible. So that's how we envisage deploying this software. How are we going to write it? So there's lots of, uh, lots of Python libraries which let you write down quantum algorithms, uh, which are usually provided by vendors of quantum uh, hardware. And there's quite a few interesting languages which don't have great backend support. And this is starting to change thanks to QIR. Um, but there's not that many alternatives. So we're looking, we're starting a new project called Guppy. This is the mascot. Uh, Guppy stands for Grand Unified Something Python. <laughs> and basically, it's a quantum programming language which looks like Python, right? So you put, this is Python syntax. You have a decorator to tell the environment that this is a guppy program and it will be handled by the guppy compiler not by the python interpreter and that will compile down to the hardware that i mentioned earlier um, so it's embedded in python so you can have python code around this variables which are in scope of this definition are available inside this program and then you can have more stuff afterwards so it's not finished, but hopefully we'll be demonstrating it at Planck in January. So what we do so far, arbitrary control flow, arithmetic, booleans, higher order functions, nested functions, recursion, and linear types. Because we have qubits, and qubits are linear type. So unlike Python, it's statically typed. So I'm sure you're all using types in Python anyway. <laughs> and if you... <coughs> do the wrong thing here, so you try to add an integer to a string, you get a type better. Um, types are linear, so qubits are linear, so you can't uh, use the same qubit twice, like in this C not here. Qubit 1 is used two times, it should be an error, and indeed, that's detected at compile time. Um, the, for, because working with linear types and arrays is a total nightmare, we're also planning to have a qubit reference type, which will not be linear. Um, but there are some details about how these types should interact that haven't been ironed out yet. And just to show an example, here is what that repeat until success program I showed you earlier in QSharp might look like if it was written in copy. So you can see it has a qubit variable as an input, and inside the program, we allocate two, two qubits. <coughs> and at the end, we have to return the qubit. Okay. Uh, the intention here is that the, yes, the user will write their program in copy and in Python. The, um, the compiler will generate the hugger. Hugger will be handled by ticket for optimization. Uh, and then it'll be either lowered to the actual hardware language or to some classical code. And that will be managed by the tier Christ runtime environment and uh, oh, I live in our forthcoming cloud platform, maybe. Okay, that's all I got. Thanks for your attention.